This trigger film was developed for health services to use as part of an experience-based co-design process, EBCD. This is a patient-centred quality improvement process. The film is intended to get local people, patients, families and NHS staff talking together about how they can jointly improve people's experiences of health services. You can find out more about this process and how to use trigger films by accessing this link to the EBCD toolkit. This film draws from a collection of 37 interviews with asthma patients conducted by the Health Experiences Research Group at the University of Oxford. It includes people talking about how it feels to have asthma, about being diagnosed, managing asthma, hospital care, dealing with emergencies and about the impact of living with asthma. The full study can be accessed on www.healthtalk.org. To help us develop this work further, we'd like to know more about how you use this or other trigger films in the collection, so please do take a few moments to complete the online feedback form. It's like somebody is sitting on your chest and they've got their hands around your throat and you can feel it. It's like that there's this huge weight sitting and no matter how hard you breathe in, your chest wall feels like it's not moving at all. I just assumed people got it as young children and kept it or got rid of it. I know children now can um, reduce or get rid of their symptoms, but I haven't realised that you could be diagnosed as an adult mm. with it. So, I mean, how did you actually feel yourself about your diagnosis? I was really shocked because I just thought, how can someone as fit as me get asthma? <laughs> I think it's very misunderstood. It's not given, obviously, not have, doesn't have the same profile as other conditions like cancer and strokes and so forth. And I think the the pro, you know, as we were talking about the um, the challenge is getting the balance right because there are some people who have asthma that have very few symptoms from one year to the next, and obviously, I've been like that in the past. Yet there are other people, and I know people who can't work because of their asthma because it, you know, they are hospitalised eight, nine, ten times a year for several weeks at a time. So it's a huge continuum asthma, mm. and I think that's why it's difficult to understand. But the reality is, you know, three people die every day from asthma in the UK, so it is a serious condition. Mm. Well, I don't want to be defined by it. Um, we have a thing in Asthma UK that we don't refer to ourselves as asthmatics, because that makes us sound like victims. Mm. I'm someone who has asthma. But I don't want to be known as, you know, Jan the Asthmatic. I I, I, it's just part of my mm. bag of tricks, because everyone's, not, you know, very few people have got nothing wrong with them, let's face it. I always felt I was very lucky in having a genuine consultation. It's, it, it's the kind of desk side manner of the person you, you're talking to. But um, I always felt that was positive, uh, to be having a genuine consultation rather than being told to take these and go away. Um, and that doesn't seem to happen necessarily all that widely. Um, I think even, this is my impression, although it's not my direct experience, that, that, that probably quite a lot of healthcare professionals don't actually take the condition as seriously as it should be taken. Partially because the majority of people, all they need is reliever inhaler and you know, they're fine for a long, long time. Um, in a way that's difficult to believe because they ought to know that it can be serious and you'd have thought if they're seeing how many, you know, a couple of thousand people over the course of a year or whatever it is, then, you know, some of those people will have fairly severe asthma. I think it should be recognised, like cancer and diabetes are long-term illnesses and they're free, pay, free for the patients, why shouldn't we be treated equally in that sense? No other reason, no, no special treatment, just respectfully, equally like cancer and diabetes. It's a long, I now know I've got asthma for the rest of my life, so why should I have to pay for medication when no disrespect to someone who's got di cancer and diabetes, they don't have to. I just, you know, I couldn't stop coughing and they decided I had whatever atypical pneumonia was, but then also there was an underlying, they decided it, it was 
it was asthma as well. It, it was not handled very well. Um, and you do feel terribly alone at first. Um, if you, you know, you don't have uh, anybody that you could to ask questions of, you know, we, there was a respiratory nurse, as I recognise now, you know, um, uh, who did come and give me the news, but it was, give me the news, here are the, here's the information, <laughs> and any questions, and you're just so stunned that um, you, you just can't think of any questions uh, to ask. We know a bit later on, don't they? Yes, yes, when you've got used to the idea, but again, it's that thing, oh, this is, you know, this is the, for the rest of my life. Now, that's the difficult thing, and that is important to get through. It is for the rest of your life. It was about, it was actually about three weeks or so. Um, but by that time, by the time I actually saw the nurse, my condition was quite bad. I, I couldn't do very much. I could just about walk a hundred yards or so. Um, so I was very relieved when I had had the uh, session with the heart specialist nurse, and he told me he he um, did some scans, uh, did an ECG test that my heart was absolutely fine. There was nothing wrong with my heart at all, and I explained the experience I'd had, and he, he said, well. What happens is that when junior doctors are being trained, they're given a rule of thumb that when they look at an X-ray or, or a scan of someone's heart, if it appears to uh, be wider than half of the chest cavity, then the heart is enlarged. But that's a rule of thumb that only works for some people. And if your patient is small and slim, as I am, then it means nothing at all. Um, so it was back to the GP. I mean, at least I then knew that I didn't have a heart problem, but I felt quite angry because I'd had three or four weeks being really worried and not being investigated or treated for what was, what was causing my breathing difficulties. So uh, my GP then referred me to uh, the respiratory health clinic of my new local hospital but there was a very long wait and in the meantime she didn't suggest giving me any treatment and my condition got worse um, so although I started to feel ill in April I wasn't actually seen um, by a consultant until June and by that time I'd become as well as, as physically unwell, I'd become extremely anxious. And I wasn't aware, I am now in retrospect, I understand what happened to me, but my anxiety was so great that uh, it had started to cause um, new symptoms. So I started to get very severe back and leg pain and I didn't understand why this was happening. Once I saw the consultant, he had to try and sort out what was going on with me, what, what parts of my health issues were being caused by my anxiety, which fortunately for me he recognised quite quickly, um, and what was, what was going on that was actually caused by the respiratory problems. There was virtually no support for my emotional well-being when I was really ill with asthma and and it was a, a kind of a um, a spiral downward for me because it took so long for the physical symptoms of asthma to be treated that my m mental health really deteriorated very quickly. The main doctor was the senior partner of the group and he was the one who recognised the crackling in the chest and said right you've got asthma and then said Right, I can't see, I can't prescribe the medication, but next time you see, your, or he prescribed it, and then I, oh, that's right, he prescribed the preventer and the, the, the subutamol or Ventolin just to inhale it to help. And the next time I saw the GP, because I needed, I asked her for an explanation, she said, oh, because you have to. 
She didn't, she didn't go into details. And I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of person who I like to understand why I'm taking something. Not just because I have to, I, I need to understand the reason for it. So it helps me to appreciate the seriousness. Well, I actually had uh, an attack. I had, um, because of getting a severe coughing, I had started to have chest pains. And of course, they couldn't rule out the possibility it was a heart problem. I actually saw and got treated by a very well-known surgeon in Newham General Hospital, local to where I live, mm. who said, you haven't got a heart problem, your problem is asthmatic. He made a referral to this clinic, mm. this Shrewsbury clinic, in and that's how I got to see uh, Dr. He was an actual asthma expert mm -hmm. and also saw the nurse who was an asthma clinic nurse. Mm -hmm. And it's through that referral I got the proper treatment that I should have had when I first started. Mm -hmm. And what was that three years like before was that? Well, I was, I was doing what I could, but I have to be honest, I wasn't taking it seriously. I wasn't taking my medication as regularly because I thought, well, I don't need, I just take it when I need to. And that's, I, I foolishly, I was very lucky that nothing more serious happened. But yeah, I wasn't taking I was taking it when I thought I needed to, not regularly respecting it and treating it as seriously. I didn't fully understand what controlling asthma was. I didn't fully appreciate the seriousness. And it's only through A, meeting the nurse, B, becoming a volunteer for Asthma UK, that I fully understood how serious it could be. Mm. And it brought home to me how lucky, how blessed I was that I didn't actually have something really bad during those three years when, when I wasn't taking it seriously and wasn't actually respecting that I needed to take the medication even when I didn't think I needed to. I see my GP at least every six months. Mm -hmm. I phone him up more if I'm not well or something. I saw him last week. I've got to go for a medicines review in um, August. Um, I think probably I try to manage on my own a lot. Um, I think I'm lucky I've got a very good GP. And I, I, you, you have to have a good relationship with one healthcare professional to actually get by. I haven't seen a consultant for over a year and the way it was left was that I could um, ring the department if I felt that I needed to see somebody and there have been times in the last few months where I thought, well, maybe that's what I need to do. Uh, and then I've changed my mind because my symptoms come and go. And what I, I feel I don't have is I don't have any kind of benchmark of understanding whether my symptoms are under control or not. And that's the kind of information that, that I feel I, I need to discuss with someone. But what happens is I might have a bad we can think, right, yes, I need to make that phone call because I feel I need and want to talk to a consultant. Um, and, and, and then the symptoms will improve. And I think, well, actually, maybe I am managing. So I'm really unsure. Oh, um, I've had no kind of regular reviews. Um, no kind of monitoring of how I'm getting on after the first 12 months and I'm sure my consultant had the best of intentions when he said um, I'm going to trust you to get in touch with us if you feel you need to talk through what's happening to you but even and I consider myself to be someone who's quite assertive outside the kind of health area but it's just so difficult to know whether, uh, whether I need help and what kind of help I might need. So I think in, in looking back at it now, I think it would be much wiser for there to be a regular system of recalls at least once every 12 months. And that's not my experience. I think giving lots of points of access for asthmatics into the services. So, you know, if you have a situation where you have an asthma clinic and it deals with everything to do with asthma and there isn't another point of access, I think that's quite limiting. But I think when somebody is diagnosed, if they quickly learn that it's better to stay in contact, then 
then they quickly learn to be more organised and then they quickly get to a point where they don't need to be so much in contact. So I suppose that would be what I would say. When people are first diagnosed, really important to let them feel that there's a sense of support around them. Um, now, that could be, again, coming from somebody who's had a couple of serious attacks and the fear factor of wanting the reassurance. And there might be other people who get a diagnosis for asthma and it's milder and they haven't had that and they don't feel that they want you know, to have that reassurance. But I think making pathways to, to support accessible, it would be, you know, the main thing. Theoretically, you should have an annual review at least. Okay. Unfortunately, my local practice does not do that. Right, okay. So I have to make the appointment myself to ensure that I get seen, I get my med medication, mm. which is becoming quite costly, but I'm on a prepaid prescription uh, facility. Um, and I have to ensure that, that I get repeat prescriptions made Otherwise, I don't get called up for a view as I should be. Okay. And I'm very cross about that. The best advice has been the, the clinic, asthma clinic nurse. Um, otherwise, the medical profession has just been, here you are, get on with it, and bye-bye. Mm. I'm lucky to have 10 minutes with my GP. So by the autumn, um, I, was, I was beginning to feel that I, was, I would never be well. I felt like I could never... I, my, I could never breathe properly and when my asthma was bad it was particularly difficult. I was having time off work and this wasn't what my perception of asthma had been. My perception of asthma had been that people managed fairly well and then if they have an asthma attack they used a blue inhaler. I'd seen people doing that. Five, ten minutes later they were fine again and they carried on with life and that's not how it was for me. I was just having difficulty breathing at some point every day. And my GP was really helpful. Um, he, uh, he said, you know, no, absolutely, we, we've got to get on top of this and um, uh, you don't have to give up work. We have to find a way of controlling your asthma so that it fits in with your lifestyle. You don't have to change your lifestyle. We have to, we have to be able to treat this asthma so that you can manage the lifestyle that you've always had. And that was really helpful. The other thing that, that he did that was um, very helpful to me, although I know that other people have, have a different view, um, is that uh, we, we set up a system of sort of telephone consultations. Um, so he would be in touch with me probably once a fortnight, once every three weeks. Every time he put me on a new inhaler, he'd ring me two or three weeks later to see how I was getting on. Uh, and that worked for me because I was travelling all over the country. So I had consultations with my doctor and coffee breaks during meetings. Um, once when I was on the top of a, a hill in Yorkshire when I was on holiday. And that worked really well. And once or twice um, when I was really not feeling terribly good, he would ask me to go and see him and I would just drop everything and wherever I was and make my way back home and go and see him. Uh, so that was helpful. When I was younger, I felt I was very much just left to it mm -hmm. um, because I never went for an what they call an asthma review when I was younger. I didn't, you know, that that just didn't didn't happen. Um, if my asthma was bad, I went and saw a doctor, and they, you know, looked at my inhalers and had a fiddle with them, and mm. off I was packed again, you know. But whereas with nowadays because you can pick up the phone and ring your doctors and say oh you know i'm not quite sure and they can make you a, a, an appointment for an asthma review or just to check up mm. with somebody to check things out mm. i feel it can be it's looked after a lot better now mm. than what it was when i was younger mm. and i think that's the key to a lot of things is that if the health profession is more understanding and more helpful and more there for you more, you're more willing to go back and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't feel comfortable and you don't feel you're getting the support, you're not going to go back, you're not going to ask questions. Mm -hmm. They just need to, they've got to appreciate that more and more, I mean, they say it themselves that more and more people have it. It just can't sort of be, here's some medication that go away. Mm -hmm. I think they've got to look at it as, you know, a bit more important than that, that um, 
you know, then realise that it has such a wider impact on your life, in, you know, sort of, in a way, indirectly, that they maybe not considered before. I have other conditions as well um, and it becomes a vicious circle. One drug that you might think for your asthma is fine but unless that consultant knows your entire medical history you're going to end up at some point with a contraindication and one drug isn't going to agree with another drug. So you'd, I have found I've had to take my entire life history and all my medical treatment all my consultants at all the different hospitals, you have to carry it with you when you go because you can't assume that they're going to know because quite often they don't. Um, and trying to deal with the different consultants that you meet over time because once you've got the condition over a period of years you're going to meet a lot of different healthcare professionals and they're all going to be different. Their ways of doing things are different, their manners are different and you've got to find a way to build a relationship with them because otherwise I don't think you always get the care that you should have because they just don't know you and they don't connect with you and unless you've got the confidence to tell them how you feel if you're happy about taking that kind of medication how it makes you feel they're not going to know and we always assume that doctors should know and by this point in my life I'm well aware that sometimes they don't and that's not because they're lacking in skill or expertise it's the fact that your condition is constantly changing treatment is changing medications are changing and it's a lot I think to expect them to always know it's not just having a diagnosis it's dealing with it I mean, one of my consultants in the past has been in a hospital 30 miles away and at the time I was too poorly to drive. So how do you get to another city when you feel rubbish, everyone else is working and you're trying to keep a job even though you're poorly. You're trying to, perhaps if you've got a very unsympathetic employer, you're trying to keep the extent of your diagnosis from them but at the same time hospitals expect you to turn up at whatever appointment time they give you even if it's 11 o'clock in the morning so you end up either having to take a day's holiday or do some serious explaining at work they expect you to be there and sometimes their attitude when you say well actually couldn't I have a, an earlier appointment couldn't I have an end of day appointment their attitude sometimes is, well, you can't be that poorly then if you don't want to come. And that is sometimes, unfortunately, the attitude you get. And you have to try and explain why, but some people don't want to know why. And it's not that you're being awkward. It's not that you're being fussy. It's, I am trying to hold down a job and perhaps a family, if you have a family. And that means you've got to have flexibility from the hospitals. They expect flexibility from you, but you don't always get it back from them. And there's a couple of hospitals in my area now that are doing evening appointments, which is just wonderful. I know it means the consultants have got to work occasionally at night, but it does mean people can hopefully stay in employment better, not brass their bosses off, or manage childcare, or they might be carers for other people. And hospitals have got to realise that it's not just, well, you need to come to the appointment because you need to see that consultant. It's, yes, I do, but I also have a life that has to be managed around that. Do they talk to you now, or they talk to your parents? Um, they talk to me now. Um, they have them um, since I was about 14, something like that. Just, I think they find now that if they talk straight to the person, like the child that they are um, like looking after, then they could get through to them better than their parents telling them. Because maybe they won't tell you the full story or whatever, or maybe they don't understand themselves. So they tell me now, yeah. Okay, and do you 
do you understand them? Meaning, do they use easy to understand language? Yeah, um, compared to what they've used in the past, when they actually do talk to me, their language is a lot easier to understand than um, when they're using like a lot of big words, which are really hard to understand. When you see, when you have your consultation, are they interested in in your in your life? I mean, in your schooling, in your friends. Do they ask questions about that? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's how they get through to you more because they don't talk about what you've got so much. They they talk about like what's going on in your life, and they use that to explain um, what you've got basically. So like. Um, if they ask me about sport, then they can use that to help explain how my asthma is going to affect that. So that's, that's a bit an easier way of actually explaining what's going on. So when you've been admitted to hospital, what kind of thing happens when you go into hospital? Um, they just kind of give you the same treatments as you get at home, which is why a lot of people with asthma don't like to go into hospitals. Um, I mean, I know that if anything, if it suddenly deteriorated badly, then you're in the right place because you know they've got all the equipment necessary. I try to avoid it, <laughs> but uh, there are times when it is inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is it? I think the the thing I don't like about hospitals is is the re re regime, you know, which has to be because it's a hospital. Whereas at I tend to, at night times, which I find the worst because you're by yourself and. Um, you can't really feel like phoning anybody here or anything like this and you're sitting wheezy. So you have maybe a cup of tea and you're watching television. You can do all that when you're at home, but in hospital, mm -hmm. you've got other people to think about. So you're just alone with your thoughts at night. There's only one bad experience I've ever had with the NHS. And that was when I went into hospital for a completely different condition. Uh, I lost my blood salts for some reason. I had a really bad asthma attack. And... I wasn't in a ward that dealt with respiratory conditions. There was this particular nurse one night. I had no medication and I said to her, I said, I've got to have this. She says, you'll get it at eight o'clock in the morning. I said, no, I haven't had this. And I, I, I don't know what I did, but she said I offended her. And I can't remember anything because I was confused. So I went that whole night without any asthma medication. It was, and my peak flow just sunk down and down and down. She was really hot. She says, I've got people with real problems. Gosh. And that was upsetting. And I think that's something that um, they've really got to think about, is where somebody has a pre-existing condition when they go in, that has to be very, very carefully managed, as well as the other thing that they're in for. Right, yes. And I don't think they understand that at all. Really? Well, my, my, my GP is, is fantastic, and as is my consultant. So I just need to... I, I mean, I, I get told off of the GP for not calling him out, you know, not told off for calling him out unnecessarily, but, so he would, they, they come out. They've got a really good um, network of, they've got a GP cooperative, so you can see a GP any 24 hours, uh, you know, any time, in tw any period of 24 hours, and if, if it's at the middle of the night, they'll send a taxi for you to take you to, to see the collect cooperative GP. So is it a case of being able to recognise when you actually, at the point at which you would yes. perhaps need some help? Yes, and I've got an emergency admission card as well, So, and I know I can phone an ambulance as well, I've only ever done that once. So. We were a bit dubious about using the ambulance service down here because we'd had a bad experience where we used to live where an ambulance man turned up and basically, you know, inferred that he was not a taxi service. You know, why, you know, we've got two cars outside, why couldn't they take me down? Um, but here they've said, no, nope, call an ambulance, whatever you need to. Um, and also, when you get to A&E, it's a lot easier if you go in an ambulance because you bypass reception. You bypass all the, the people being sick and the people with the bleeding hands and things, you know. I mean, the couple of times I have sort of walked in, you know, if, if I've, if mum and dad have taken me down or whatever, they do tend to sort of drop what they're doing and come and see me, A, because they know me, and B, because breathing conditions or breathing problems do get priority. And also, I've now got um, a yellow community folder which basically is provided by a community matron. And it's in this folder, it's got my management plan, all my drugs, 
my history and everything in it, so I can just give it to the ambulance men. I don't have to, you know, they say, well, your date of birth, your address, your phone number, you just give it to them and say, it's all in there. You know, all my allergies are in there, contact details of people, everything. The other thing that I've um, been able to set up since I've been down here is I have a, a management plan written by my consultant. Um, because what's happening was, when you go into A&E, there's this textbook, um, sorry I moved didn't I? Right. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's this textbook protocol of how you manage an asthmatic. And over the years, we've discovered, trial and error, what works with me and what doesn't. And my consultant's view is why reinvent the wheel. So I now have it written down. It says, yeah, when Jenny turns up in a &E, you should have done this, this and this. So you should do this, clinically reassess, then do this, and then reassess and then do this. You know, and it's sort of, it's written, and it's slightly different to what the textbook for the junior doctor says. But it's what works for me. Um, and it, it's, it has helped because, you know, the doctor sort of says, oh, you come with instructions. Fair enough, just, just do what he says. It's fine. Thank goodness for the paramedic service in the local east area where I live. They're very understanding and very, very respectful. And they're still treating me, you know, strict, carry on treating me, even though they suspect it could be just a panic attack. Mm -hmm. They'll still take me seriously. And that, that means a lot to me because, you know, to look at me, I don't have a broken arm. I don't have something visible to, to say that I'm ill, but they know the symptoms. They now, I think, I believe they're being trained to recognise it more quickly and uh, to appreciate. And also it's the respect factor that, you know, I'm saying I'm not well, and that, oh, don't be silly woman. You, you've heard people say that to other people. And you think, just because they don't look it doesn't mean to say they're not ill. Mm. And that's, I think it's very valuable to have that respect factor involved and uh, to have people taking you seriously and actually listening to you rather than saying we know better, we're medical professionals. Number one, all asthmatics are different. Don't, don't label, don't stick us all in the same box. You know, don't, don't assume that we'll all have the same attitude to things um, and that you can treat us all the same way. Um, and I, I, it's great when they acknowledge that you have the condition and you've lived with it and you know what you're doing. Um, I mean, now I've, I've got A&E well trained now. When I go in there, they say, what do you want? What do you need? Because they know that I know that I've lived with this for a long time. So I will say to them, well, can you listen to this? Am I wheezy? Am I this? Am I that? And they'll, and they'll say, yes, whatever. And they'll treat me. So you're, you're seen as the expert on your condition in a sense? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of medical professionals will say that. Oh, well, it's your condition, you're the expert, you know. And then they'll completely ignore you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, hang on, you just told me that I'm the expert and I live with it. And, and I am. I, mean... I feel that if I want to say anything at all, if you can survive it, it's not the end of the world. You think it is when it's happening. It's one of the most terrifying things to have an asthma attack. It's terrifying to have it and it's terrifying to watch it, but it passes. You know, the doctors are brilliant nowadays. The medication is superb. Um, people understand a lot more about why uh, you are having this attack and how you can prevent another attack. Um, and you can still grow up, have a career, fall in love, fall out of love get a job, have children, do all the normal things that people do, travel the world. I wouldn't recommend the Arctic because um, it's too cold. But you can do, you know, practically everything that everybody else does. You don't have to be imprisoned by it.